Well, good morning, Covenant Church. It's good to see you. How many of you know what an occupational hazard is? Yeah, some of you have experienced an occupational hazard, and, and I've, I've experienced just such a hazard several times in my life. For example, there have been a few times over the last 28 years of my marriage to Mrs. Rainey when I was getting ready to teach a group of people like you what it looks like to have a God-honoring marriage. Just, just before that happened, we had the gosh awfulest fight you've ever seen in your life. That's called a preacher's occupational hazard. I'm having a little bit of an occupational hazard this morning. Let me just be honest with you. This is a series. We're starting it this morning. It's brand new. It's incredibly important. It's timely. I've been praying over this for months. It's called non-anxious presence, and I'm anxious about it. And I, I'm, I'm serious. I know how you would laugh at that, but I, I really am serious. I don't think it really hit me all that much or all that powerfully until, honestly, just a few moments ago up in the office. I'm, I'm just kind of going over final things, doing what most people do before they get ready for a presentation like this. I'm marking through stuff that doesn't need to be said. I'm writing notes in the margins. I'm getting ready for the sort of the final moment of this. And my, my eyes landed ultimately where they should land, and that's on the text of God's Word. And... and um, I'm feeling something of a weight, the weight I know you're carrying, and, and the weight that I believe God wants to lift, and the weight that I'm incapable of lifting from you. And so um, I'm just, just being honest. I'm just, I'm just, I'm feeling that right now. I mean, that, honest, truthfully, this is God's pure, inspired, powerful, penetrating, perfect. Word. I probably ought to feel like this every week, honestly. But I'm feeling it more acutely today that I don't want to get in the way of what the Lord wants to say to you starting today. So would you bow with me and let's pray together. Holy Spirit, come. And just obliterate anything aside from your direct and clear communication to your people today. Bless them. Lord, confront them with truth, with things they may need to turn from in order to get there. But may we leave today with a great hope, a hope that you not only offer us in this moment, but you, you offer all of eternity and every group of people that have ever called you and been called by your name. Father, grant us, grant us freedom to be who you've called us to be in a moment like this, such a critical moment. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, non-anxious presence, anxiety. Who's felt anxiety? In a room a little bit fuller than it usually is even. I suspect there's a few folks that have an interest in this. It's always been part of the human experience. We live in a fallen world. We should expect that this is going to be part of it. This feeling that we get on occasion, even in a normal world, a, nor a world that's more predictable even than the one we're living in right now. And so this feeling of, of dread, fear, uneasiness, it, it comes upon us and it, it attacks us by unsettling our souls. And in acute cases, we've even seen where it, it, it calls for a mental health professional or even at some higher level, uh, a physical, a medical professional, somebody because there's physical symptoms that have been actuated from this, sleeplessness, a rapid heartbeat. And, and, and the truth of the matter is all of us at some point have, in our adult lives, we've experienced anxiety at some level. It's just part of life in a fallen world. What I want to talk about is what's happened over about the past five years or so that has ratcheted this up both internally in our souls and, and externally. The whole world has witnessed a rise, exponential rise in anxiety. It covers our whole society like a wet blanket. So it doesn't now just invade your heart. It, it's actually invaded the culture of entire institutions that we once counted on. It's invaded and interrupted the well-being of entire cultures, our whole nation. In fact, the whole world. I mean, there's a Barna research study that came out some years ago of a study of millennials and Gen Z. So anybody born after 1980 
And that includes people born, of course, Gen Z, any time after 1998. They wanted to see the, the current adult generation and the one that's emerging right behind them. And what does this look like globally? So we're talking 15,000 surveys spread out over 25 countries. This isn't just the United States we're talking about. And, and this is what they came back with, that a central aspect of experience for this generation above anything else, heads and shoulders, is anxiety. And they defined it in, in exactly the same way that I'm defining it for you, a feeling of dread and fear and uneasiness. That was done in 2019. So think about what the last 30 months have done to that. There is now nowhere you can go, nowhere you can look where you are not reminded how broken the world is. That's the reality that we're sitting in right now. And, of course, all that's happening against the backdrop of a world that was already sort of rapidly changing, what social media was doing to our ability to do everything from communicate effectively with each other to, to even just thinking critically, radically shifting sexual ethics in our culture, abuse scandals at the highest levels of some of our most trusted institutions, all in a phase of human history that was already transitional. And I, I kept looking for a word for it. And finally, in the spring of this year, I found it in a book written by, written by an Australian pastor named Mark Sayers. And all of our elders have read it now. It's called A Non-Anxious Presence. That's, that's, that's where I, I stole the title from Mark. So there you go. All right. And, and Mark calls this moment a gray zone. A gray zone. It, it's a period in history when you've got an old era with institutions and assurances and things that you just sort of took for granted, all the 99-cent things that we just think are always going to be there that are either out and out gone completely or you can kind of see they may be on the verge of disappearing, diminishing. You know because you kind of understand the history is linear and purposeful that, that there's a succession of moments coming beyond that, which means there's another era coming and eventually, there'll be another stack of things that we can count on. Other 99 cent, well, maybe a dollar 99 with inflation. But you know what I'm saying? Like, it's coming, but it's not here yet. And so we're now caught in between. That's where we're at. And it is called, I think accurately, the gray zone. You and I, as followers of Jesus, have been put here right now in this moment. And we've been called, simply by virtue of the fact that this is where God has put us in history, we've been called to navigate a gray zone. That's a period of history defined by a lack of clarity, a lack of certainty, a lack of predictability. Our time is characterized because of all that happening. But you've got the demise of two things that are driving both internal and external anxiety into the stratosphere. The first is what we'll just say is the demise of trust. See, one of the things in that old era that we thought we could always count on was our common understanding of what was true. Absolutely everything is debatable now. Have you noticed that? That's the world we're living in. And that distrust now extends to institutions, universities, government, the church even. When, when These are formative to who we are. When you attend the university, when you get elected to Congress, you become part of an institution that's supposed to form you so that you can then serve the public at large. But then what's happened instead is those are now platforms used as performative by all kinds of people. We won't even get into names. I know you know who they are. And so what happens, you have this, this demise of trust, societal decay and breakdown is the inevitable result. The second thing is the destruction of isolation, which is just wickedly ironic because we're more connected than we've ever been before, and simultaneously we're more lonely than we've ever been before. And so the result of all this is a crazy cycle. It's like a flywheel, right? You, you have this growth of distrust and hostility that results in a greater increase in personal anxiety, and then that anxiety in turn increases the greater external distrust and hostility until finally we see, kind of like we do now, the entire planet engulfed to some degree by the tyranny of the anxious. This is where we are. And in the church, we've tended to respond to anxiety at even the micro level in a couple of ways that are not helpful. And if we're especially going to be people called to the moment at the macro level, we're going to have to change a couple of things. First is this posture that basically says, pray it away. Pray it away, right? So anxiety in this view is seen as exclusively what Jesus talks about when he talks about worry. 
In other words, it's always a sin, and if you're experiencing, there's something wrong with you. Maybe you haven't read your Bible enough. Maybe you haven't prayed enough. Maybe So this is solely a spiritual thing. we got to pray it away. That, that would have been really, a really, really strange argument to make to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. So pray it away doesn't work, okay? Is prayer important? Yes. Can we move forward without prayer? No. Pray it away. Here, here's the other extreme. Farm it out. Anxiety. See, in our rightful response to pray it away, we've said, you know what? We, we need to understand that, that mental health professionals, by the way, including several of your brothers and sisters sitting right here who are credentialed in those areas of expertise, are a gift of common grace from our God. We need to be thankful for them. We need to pray for them. That line to their office is a whole heck of a lot longer than it was 30 months ago. They need our support. They need our prayers. What they don't need is us just farming it all out to them. Right? That, that's the other extreme here. Oh, well, I'm not really qualified. You need to go see a therapist. Well, I have told people several times in my office, this is beyond my capacity. You should see a therapist. But you know what's been added to that in the last 30 months? This is beyond my capacity. You should see a therapist. And by the way, there's a really long line. I'm sorry to tell you. It's going to be a while. Folks, while they're waiting in line, there are more than a few things that the people of God can do with the word that God has given us. More than that. And so we got to get off of these extremes, the pray it away, the, the farm it out. And here's, here's the reason, because both of those see anxiety in a very myopic way. They see anxiety as a problem to be solved. I feel this way. I don't want to feel this way anymore. And so I, I just, I need somebody to take away the feeling. What if instead anxiety is the very thing that God intends right now for you and I to leverage for his greater glory and what's coming in the next era? That's what I want to talk about in, in the coming weeks. That God uses even those moments when we're afraid. What was the, I don't even remember his name, but one of the guys that stormed Normandy Beach during World War II on D-Day, and he said, courage is the guys who are scared to death, but they go anyway, right? So, so we're, we're not just doing away, I, don't want, I want to do away with a feeling because I want to feel euphoric. Well, so does every other normal person on the planet. But the question is, is that really where God wants us? And why else would he have put us in this place for this time? This is where God has placed us and the hope and the challenge of the next few weeks leading up to the holidays. God provides a way in this environment, okay? It doesn't have to change. For you and I to both live non-anxiously and to replicate our non-anxious presence to the world. This is a crisis. Now, let me tell you something. Look at history for a moment. Crisis and uncertainty of the sort that we are experiencing right now in our culture is always, always the thing that comes right before revival. I want you to sit in that for a minute, okay? God doesn't revive people who are comfortable because comfort don't produce revival. Certainty doesn't produce revival. Let me tell you what does. The very kind of atmosphere that you and I are experiencing. Moments like this have produced some of the greatest spiritual awakenings this world has ever known. And what I think God wants to know of this congregation is, are we going to be ready for that moment? Are we going to meet that moment? Not just internally, externally. That's what we're talking about. And in the intervening weeks, we're even going to take some weeks off and talk about some other subjects because I, I just think rather than hitting you like water from a fire hose, we need to make a, take a break for about a week and then come back to it again and then take another break and then come back to it again. But you need to keep coming week after week. I'm telling you, God has something for you and for all of us in this moment. We know that not just because God's Word tells us so, but because God's word also tells us we are far from the first people that, are ever, that have ever been called to live in an age like ours. That brings me to Isaiah. This prophet spoke and preached God's word for 40 years, and, and that moment was inaugurated with the death of Uzziah. Uzziah was a beloved king in Israel. It's been a long, long time, regardless of what party you're in, I think we would all agree, been a long, long time since we've had a leader in this country that whether you voted for the guy or not, you looked at him and you kind of liked him, right? I, I understand that. Uzziah was one of those people. 
Even people that may have disagreed, man, he was just a beloved figure. He was a uniter. He was a strengthener of their nation, their economy, their national identity. And so when he dies, his death brings this level of uncertainty, particularly to the southern kingdom of Judah. Israel was split in two at this point in history. And so, so the prophet has a message to two distinct groups of people. The first 39 chapters are addressed to this first group living in his own day. And his words to them are not encouraging. He says, it's going to get worse before it gets better. He says, God is going to take his people through a period of rapid and rough historical and cultural transition. And before it's over, the northern kingdom will be conquered and scattered by the Assyrians. The southern will be enslaved by the Babylonians. Everything you know and think you will always know from this point until eternity is about to change. Then starting in chapter 40, he addresses a second group. This group hadn't been born yet. They will live some two centuries after Isaiah has penned these words and died and gone to meet Jesus himself. These are the remnant that are going to result from Judah's trials. And the prophet says to them, God will restore Israel through you and make you a light to all of the other nations. Here's what he's saying. You, my people, will be the non-anxious presence in the middle of a period that is characterized by two centuries of global chaos. I'm not going to make the world better. I'm going to make you a light to the dark world. That's what I'm going to do. And so a couple of things. Number one, you know what God's saying to Israel? I've put you in a gray zone. I've put you in a period in which everything your mama and your grandma took for granted has, is about to be taken from you. But here's the second thing he's saying. In that context, right, not, 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 I'm, I'm not giving it all back to you. No, I'm going to give you something better. I'm going to give you the capacity to do several things. Number one, you're going to sing in the middle of this. Verse 1, sing, O barren one, who did not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not been in labor. I'm going to give you the capacity, furthermore, to enlarge. Look at verse 2. Enlarge the place of your tent. Let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. You know what's going to happen? You're going to sing in the middle of the desert, in the middle of the darkness, in the middle of the poverty. You're going to have a joy that the world knows nothing of. And when the anxiety gets ratcheted up to a point that the point of pain is now greater than the, than the desire, the, the, point, the, the, the desire to change is, is now there because of the pain point. They're going to look at you, my people. And they're going to go, they've got something that we need. We thought all this time we needed our normal back. We thought all of this time that we just needed to go back to the certainty and back to the predictability and back to that. What we need is whatever they've got. And then they're going to find out that Israel has a God who is enough for them. Israel has a God who is enough for them. This is what's going to happen. So what he's saying is, prepare to sing in the middle of an angst-filled world and prepare to enlarge your tent because refugees are coming. And they're going to join you in that. And the result of all of this is be fearless. Verse 4, fear not. You will not be ashamed. How do you live that way in a world like this? Like, like, how's that even happen? Well, Isaiah 54 answers that question. Here's what you need to know. The anxiety you feel most of the time, okay, Jesus does confront this thing called worry. He does tell us that it's a sin. It's something that needs to be repented of. That's true. But the way we use the term anxiety in the modern world, is this, there's not always a one-to-one -one correlation merely with what Jesus is talking about. So I'm hoping to give you some hope through this word this morning. Anxiety most of the time is not caused by a lack of faith on your part. It's not. Otherwise, Jesus had a lack of faith in the garden. Go back and read it. Sweating, as it were, great drops of blood. Tell me that's not anxiety on the part of your Lord and mine. It, it's not most of the time caused by a subpar prayer life. It's not caused by not reading enough of God's Word. Now, I probably should say this at this point. If you're not reading God's Word on a regular basis, you're not going to Him in prayer, you're not, then you certainly are not going to see Him move, and you certainly are going to experience some problems. I just want you to get the hope that it, it's not always about you. Look, there's something in me I've got to fix. There's something wrong with me. 
Often, though, anxiety is caused by a lack of focus on the right object. Because life is scary and unpredictable. Y'all agree with that? Yeah. How many of you would have said, eh, I'm not so sure about that three years ago, and you're not like, yeah, I'm in. It's scary. It's unpredictable. Right? It seems pretty dark out there. And especially in recent years, we've experienced what I'll call the illusion of, of control up until about three years ago, and now we're realizing it, it really was just house cards, just a big illusion. We're not in control of anything. And we have to learn how to live relative to a different place and a different time. And oftentimes the difference between anxious and the non-anxious in moments like this is whether in those moments you are focusing more on the world around you or on the God above you. That's what you need to know. You gotta learn to see God in the midst of the chaos. That's what we're gonna talk about today. That's the key to finding your way through anxiety and toward the victory that he has for you. It's what the prophet is teaching his people here. How do I develop a confident understanding of God in the gray zone? Well, the first way I do that is by just getting settled in my soul four divine characteristics about this God. He doesn't just tritely say, stop looking at your circumstances and look at God. He says, let me describe this God for you. John Piper said, people are starving for the greatness of God. Most of them would never give that as a diagnosis of their own soul. But that's exactly what the problem is. So let's talk about four things here. God's activity in this moment, God's faithfulness in history, like before you were born and after you're gone, still faithful, God's promises in uncertainty, God's presence in the chaos. All right, let's talk about these, starting with his activity in this moment. The, the prophet says in verse 5, for your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and the Holy One of Israel is your redeemer, the God of the whole earth. He is called. So, so God is our maker. Well, that, that's actually true in a couple of ways. The wider witness of Scripture is that God is our creator. And in that, in that way, he made us. He barad us. That's the, 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 the Hebrew term. It means to create literally out of nothing. The Latin theologians refer to creation ex nihilo. Right? If I go to create something, i got to have some raw materials or I can't create it. God didn't need any raw materials. He simply spoke the raw materials into existence. And then later on, some six days later then, he, he took some of that matter, those raw materials, and he very intimately formed your and my first father and mother, male and female, in his image and after his likeness. That is absolutely true. God is creator, but, but that's not what the word maker means here. Maker in this environment and in this context refers to doing a transforming work in us. I made you, and now I'm changing you. And I'm doing it in the midst of the circumstances that you now find yourself in. And so, so the prophet reminds us that person is the God of the whole earth, that nothing is out of his control. I know that troubles some of you. You're like, wait a minute, well, then why doesn't he stop this? Why doesn't he stop that? Why? I get it. A lot of, lot of heavy questions. Many of which, well, they're really all of which. I'm not going to be able to answer today. I get it. I get that's a struggle. That, that struggle is welcome here, but you don't, you don't do away with that struggle by denying what God has actually revealed himself to be. Nothing is out of his control. There is not a single blade of grass on my front lawn in Shepherdstown that has died over the last six weeks as the weather's gotten colder that, I, that our sovereign God has not fully been con in control over. He's got it all. The God of the whole earth. And, and, and that God, Isaiah reminds us, is our husband. Now that metaphor, marriage, needs to be understood in light of the patriarchal world that it, that it was seen in. See, a lot of wives hear this, hey, you have a husband. And, and how many of you ladies have a husband? I bet as many hands as went up are just as many opinions about what that means. Yeah. See, see, for Mrs. Rainey, sometimes the reminder that you have a husband just simply means you're living with a dude that about three times a day he goes, hey, where's that thing I was looking for? And then you got to get up and go find it for him. And, and by the way, when you find it, about nine times out of ten, it's right in front of his freaking face. 
I, I think Amy probably thinks that sometimes when, when she hears, you have a husband. Yes, I do. Some of you, we've, we've actually, as a family, we've, we've celebrated some retirements. Some of you, you finally made it, right? You got the gold watch or whatever. Either way, you ain't working anymore. You don't have to work anymore. And, and there's some wives probably thinking, yeah, I have a husband. I have a guy that's at home a whole lot more. And I kind of thought I was going to enjoy this a little bit more. And I kind of, and the word, un, the phrase underfoot keeps coming up. I have a husband. Yes, I do. Well, in a patriarchal society, you got to remember that a woman without a husband, I'm not saying this is right. In fact, it wasn't right. But a woman without a husband was a hopeless, vulnerable woman. And in verse 5, the prophet reminds a nation as she stands in the chaos of civilization, you have a husband. That means more in a patriarchal world than just you're married. It, it means you're protected. You're provided for. You have one who takes full responsibility for your well-being. And by the way, that, that really ain't a bad idea for men today. That's another message for another day. All right? It, it means the, the weight of the family is on you. I get asked sometimes, do you believe in male headship in the home? Yes, I do. Let me tell you what I don't believe. I don't believe that biblical male headship calls for us to go back to some 1950s version of sexual politics or telling women what they can and cannot do in this environment. Head means source. Let's actually say what the Bible says and not make up our own crap because we want to go back to some age that makes the men comfortable. Headship means source. Think about the headwaters of a river. It means everything downstream of Joel Rainey needs to flourish if Joel is the man of God that God has called this man to be. And that starts with Amy Rainey, and it goes from there to my children. That's what it means. And that's what it means here. The Lord of the whole earth is your husband. It means you're going to be provided for. You're going to flourish but even husbands who intend the best, we don't always get it right, do we? Those of us who want to, all right, and it breaks our hearts sometimes when we can't do everything we want to do for our wife, for our children. And some of you have even felt that even worse. There's been an accident. There's been an injury. There's been a chronic illness. You can't work anymore. And as a man of God who belongs to Jesus, you should recognize this doesn't mean I'm not a man. I belong to Jesus, his death for my sin, his resurrection for me. My identity is in Christ. But I got to tell you, Pastor, I can't work anymore and I can't provide the way I used to. And this really stinks. Yeah, it does. It does. You can't solve every problem that comes along. And strangely enough, sometimes your wife doesn't even want you to. Right? We, we make mistakes. We blow it. We, we have all these issues that we don't know how to solve. The prophet reminds Israel, you, God's people, are in a marriage where this will never, ever, ever, ever happen. Because the one you ultimately depend on for provision and protection, the one who has assumed responsibility for you, he keeps his vows. And nothing will overwhelm him. He is not merely one of you on the earth like a normal husband would be. He's the God over the whole earth. Some of you need to hear this today because you're swimming in unfamiliar waters in your job. You've entered a new phase of raising your children. You're frightened by the way culture seems to be changing and what's going on and what's going to happen. Hear these words. The God of the whole earth is your husband. He will care for you. Non-anxiousness begins with confidence of God's benevolent activity in this moment, even when we can't always see what he's doing and even when we see what he's doing and we wish he'd do something else. The God of the earth is your husband. And, and here's how we know this, not just because God's word just said it, but because this is who God has proven himself to be throughout history. Let's look for a moment at God's faithfulness in history. Verse 6. For the Lord has called you like a wife, deserted and grieved in spirit. Like a wife of youth when she is cast off, says your God, for a brief moment I deserted you, but with great compassion I will gather you. In overflowing anger for a moment I hid my face from you, but with everlasting love I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. So let's deal up front with this rather shocking statement in verse 6, this 
least what on the surface looks like an admission by the Lord that he has deserted or abandoned Israel. Is this a God who, is, is God a husband who just steps out of a difficult marriage? Is that, is that what he's talking about? Hey, you didn't behave the way you were supposed to? I mean, we know Israel broke the covenant, was unfaithful. Does God respond in kind to this? There's a lot of ink's been spilled by scholars trying to debate what this is. I'll just tell you this to keep it short. I think the Lord here is speaking from the perception of his people. He's identifying with the way they're feeling. He has not actually abandoned them, but from their standpoint, it certainly feels like he has. And so he's, what's he doing? He's empathizing with them. That the Lord of heaven and earth is such a husband to us that he would condescend to empathize with some of our delusions about what is. All right. Our mental health brothers and sisters in the building would call this the beginning of some really solid cognitive behavioral therapy. It's going to start with empathy, and then it's going to move to, all right, let's train our minds to think about what's really and actually true here. This is where the Lord is going with this. And he says, I will gather you. I will have compassion on you. I will be in your midst. I will be with you through the suffering, which, by the way, is what compassion means. It's a compound Latin word, co passio, to suffer alongside of. I'm there with you in the middle of it. And later on in history, this is what Judah would experience. This is what I'm saying. God, God, we are not the first people to be here. Judah was there. God would allow Assyria in the north and then later on Babylon in the south to conquer his people, scatter them, enslave them, take away everything familiar to them, including the things that they associated with his presence, like the temple and the sacrificial system and all of the instruments, including the Ark of the Covenant, in the temple. And in that state of radical change and upheaval, they are enslaved. Absolutely everything they know is taken from them. But they find something outside of all that that they were never experiencing and had never experienced in hundreds of years with all of that. And this is why God takes it away. They find his presence. And you know where they find his presence? As enslaved people along the banks of the Euphrates River in Babylon. No temple no sacrificial system, none of that stuff that they thought they needed, just God and his people. And I want you to listen to me, brothers and sisters. Isaiah's message to Israel and Judah is God's message to you and me. Look at his activity in history and know just as he was with them in that moment, he is with you right here, right now, in your moment. And he is not nearly as exasperated as you are. He's not. And one of the chief ways I think we can calm our anxious minds and bodies is to acknowledge how we feel and what we sense. And then with that, just remember the truth about God. He has been there for us in the past and, and, and believe on that basis that he'll be no less faithful in the future. And that truth is immovable. No matter what's moving around you, no matter what changes around you, no matter how uncertain things may seem, let's talk about God's promises his immovable promises during uncertainty. Verse 9, this is like the days of Noah to me. As I swore that the waters of Noah should no more go over the earth, so I have sworn that I will not be angry with you and I will not rebuke you. So this is God's way of saying several things. First of all, the world has been here before. All right? I want you to remember the world, maybe not in your lifetime, all right? But the world has been here before. I know the temple is gone. Sacrifices is gone. Your freedom are gone. I, I need you to remember that this is like it was in the days of Noah, right? It could always be worse, okay? I know the temple. I know there's lots of things you want that are not part of who you are. Man, all that. You realize there was a time there, the whole world was gone, which is kind of an interesting way to approach someone who goes, well, you know, if God's really good and powerful and there's a lot of evil in the world, why doesn't he just destroy all the evil in the world? Well, he did that once by drowning everybody. I don't think that's what we want, okay? There was a time when nothing was here, but over time, the land reappeared, I made a promise to Noah after the flood when there was nothing left. And he said, I make a similar promise to you right now. I will not be angry with you. I will not rebuke you. So, so much has changed so rapidly in the past just few years. 
And because of those changes, we've changed, haven't we? Our, our, our mindsets have changed. Some of our habits have changed. It's just the nature of humanity. Our peace of mind is a lot more volatile. I think that's because five years ago there were so many things. We're talking institutions. We're talking the stock market. We're talking the price of gasoline. We're, for some of you, even the reliability of, of what you thought would be your closest relationships and something happened in the world that, that invaded even that and now those are gone. How about this one? The availability of mental health services. You may realize now more than you ever have in the past, hey, I need a good professional to talk this over with. And when you call, they say, well, it's November. We'll see you in March. So you don't even have this reliable connection any longer to that kind of help. The fabric of the Western world itself kind of seems to be tearing a little bit, doesn't it? This is the very definition of what Sayers calls a gray zone. Stuff that we, ju we just assumed it would always be there. And there's so many assurances that we don't have right now. And I'm going to tell you what's coming is a temptation to short circuit what God is doing through everything that he has arranged. Right? To just, well, if we'll just pull this lever, pull that lever, if we'll, if we'll do this, if we'll leverage that, there will be Christian institutions in the ensuing years who will tempt you by saying, give us money, align with us. Oh, I love this one, by the way. Go tell your pastor he should be saying this, and if he doesn't, you should leave. Yeah. Apparently, there's no qualification for pastoral ministry like someone who's never done it before. So... It'll happen. You know what that is? It's a temptation to short circuit what God is doing. I don't want to hurt anymore. I don't want to feel this anymore. Okay, granted, I don't like it either. Do we believe that God is capable and actually will do something powerful through us? And do we want that more than we want the pottage that he's caused us to leave behind? Because it really is pottage at the end of the day. So many assurances that we no longer have. The only way you're going to survive a moment like this with your sanity intact, because let me tell you something, you, you take those short circuit approaches, guess where you're going to be in another couple of years, right back where you started. It, it's a vicious cycle, vicious cycle. Y'all know election day is Tuesday, right? Go do your thing. Voting is important. Doing your civic duty is important. Understanding the issues is important. Voting for the right issues is important. It is not ultimate, not even close, not even in the top 100. It's just not. You know how I know this? Because it never ultimately solves anything. It's just a perpetual fight every election cycle. And some of you, that's where your anxiety comes from. You get angry, you get scared, you get, and you let that stuff overwhelm you instead of letting God's spirit burn it out of you. Because he loves you. And that, that's what's got to happen. That's what's got to happen. And I'm already hearing the nonsense from people who claim to be in my line of work. This is the most critical, vital, important. I, how long have we been hearing that crap? That's not real. That's somebody trying to hype you up so you will either give them your money or your vote. You need to turn your attention to a sovereign God who is going to decide himself who leads us. Stop pining for whatever it is that you want. Come to him. That's all. The only way you survive a moment like this with your sanity intact is if you take the long view. We are not the first to meet such a moment. Until Jesus comes back, we will not be the last. Uncertainty is the only certainty in a world that is as scarred by the curse of human sin as ours has been since that first fall in Eden. That's just the way it is. Here's what you need to know. The same God who up until this moment kept his covenant with Noah, who through Messiah we know ultimately kept his promise with Israel, will also keep his promise to you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you, no matter what. God's activity in the moment, God's faithfulness in history, God's promises during uncertainty, here's, here's what you need. God's presence during chaos. If I told you, you have two options. Option A is 
every, all the uncertainty that you wish would go away never goes away. Like for the rest of your life, there's going to be some measure of this until that other era comes. And it's probably not even going to come until after you die. I don't know. I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet. But, but I, it, it could happen. We don't know. All right? And I said to you, option A is that world continues until you die, but you have the presence of God. Or we can give you back all the little precious moments crap that you had three years ago, but you got to do it without the presence of God. What do you pick? What's your choice? See, God wants us to know, and again, there's nothing wrong with having a good time. There's nothing wrong with being sure. There's nothing wrong with certainty until we start to worship it. That's what happens to us. God says, I'm constantly with you in the chaos. Look, in fact, look at this. This is the most powerful. This, this is the one when I came out earlier and I said, I need y'all to pray for me. This is the one, right? This is the verse that just jumped off the page. For the mountains may depart and the hills be removed, but my steadfast love shall not depart from you. And my covenant of peace shall not be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you. And one of the hardest things for, for comfortable people is to just remember God never promised us an easy life. Never. He never promises that the things we love most in this world will always be there for us. And this rhetorical flourish emphasizes that, that point again. The mountains may depart. Now, I love getting up in the morning. I did it this morning. Get myself a cup of coffee, walk out on my back deck, look to my right. You know what I see? More clearly now, because the leaves have started falling away, I see the Blue Ridge Mountains, and they're gorgeous. And, and moreover, they remind me of home, because if you know anything about my history, you know I grew up in upstate South Carolina, and I used to get up as a kid every morning and look east, and I would see the southern tip of the Blue Ridge Mountains that I now look at the northern tip of. There's something about those mountains that grounds me. There's something about those mountains that reminds me of home. That's not wrong. That's, that's precious to me. But I'm reminded here, you know what? It, it really is possible. I might get up one morning and look to my right, and they won't be there. After all, thousands of years ago, they were underwater. God let that happen. So, so what else is coming? I don't know. I don't know. I just know my hope can't be even in something as seemingly permanent as the mountains. Here's what it needs to be in. Two things. God says, my steadfast love for you, my covenant of peace for you. Our church is called covenant. I think sometimes we, we so lose the impact of what that word means, especially when it's God who strikes that covenant with us. It means he will, he will never break a promise. This is how strong my commitment is to you in the chaos. My lifeline is there for you. You will not drown. You will not lose, even if it feels like you do, because you have my steadfast love and you have my covenant of peace. It is stronger than the mountains that may depart. The hills will go away before this goes away. Think about it in more modern terms. You think about the U.S. military. All right, Let, let's think about the Pentagon. Let's think about all branches of the armed services. Let's, let's think about what God might say to us today to describe something of the strength of his covenant. And he might even tell us, I want you to think for just a moment about the raw, uninhibited almost power of the mightiest, most fearsome military force that has ever existed in all of human history. That's the United States military. My covenant is stronger the Pentagon will be leveled before I will give up on you. That's what he's saying. And so are you going to look to me? Because this is, this is where the non-anxious presence comes from. Or are you going to look to me? You don't need all those other things. You need me. And, and maybe in those anxious moments, we, even starting with me, I should just pray less. God, would you give this back to me? God, could I have that back? God, could you make it work out this way? And just more, God, just... God, give me yourself. God, give me yourself. My greatest mentor in ministry right now keeps asking this question. He started asking it of himself. I've started asking it of myself. When is Jesus going to be enough for you? And not merely use him as some vehicle to get what you want or to take the wheel 
or we, we, we have so consumerized American Christianity. I, honestly, I think that may be why the par, par, we're, we're sensing the, the tearing apart of the fabric. Listen, you can, you can blame this group or that group or that cultural group or these people that want to burn it down or these people. That want to, listen, Almighty God is over all this. Did you not, do you not remember? The maker of heaven and earth, the one who forms us, the one who forms history. You want to know who's tearing the Western world apart right now? It's a sovereign God who's doing it. Because we have taught our people that you come to Jesus to have a good sex life. You come to Jesus to make more money. You come to Jesus. And what we're being reminded of in this moment is you come to Jesus to get Jesus. He's enough. And when you're able to live in that space, Oh my gosh, people, what freedom is there in that? What power is there in that? So you can, we can pine for the realities that were and, and just continue. Even if you get it back, you'll continue to be tormented with anxiousness until you die. Shalom comes from him. Peace. He's the only one who can give it. And so that, that's what we're going to do in the ensuing weeks. We're going to Explore what God's Word teaches us about how this happens. Today, we've already learned this starts with the Spirit-empowered ability to just turn loose of anything in this world that you've been using as a pacifier. Come to the one who gives genuine peace. See, right now, the world is looking for a sanctuary, a place of refuge, all right, a place where they can get away. Wasn't it interesting how COVID took all that away? Have you noticed, like, like if, you, if you have a hurricane, if you have a tornado, you have an earthquake, something, just sort of like, even if it's like a mass disaster, you could always get on an airplane and fly somewhere where the disaster isn't. And you could have some people. Like, there was nowhere you could go where you weren't reminded of the brokenness of the world. That's where God has placed us right now. And, and, and what he's trying to say is don't look for a place to retreat. I'm telling you. Tuesday morning, some of y'all going to watch the news. You're going to get all wrapped up, tied into the banjo string about the effect of whatever this election is going to do. You know why? Because politics has become your sanctuary. And yet you wonder why you're so bent out of shape all the time. And why you hate people that think differently than you. It's because you've made something your sanctuary that's never really going to give you the peace that God gives. Again, I'm not telling you the issues aren't important. I'm not telling you shouldn't be involved. I I'm saying don't make it your God. And you know it's your God. Don't be the, oh, you're calling me an idolater. What do you think about more? That's idolatry. That's what that is. I've committed it before. God will forgive you of it. I'm not telling you it's hopeless. I am telling you if you are an idolater, you should repent of that. And the first step in repentance is admitting you're an idolater. And turning to a God who says, let me give you a non-anxious presence internally. Let me give you a state of being beyond anything you thought possible in a world like this so that the world looks at the church and doesn't see a, a sanctuary like what we're talking about here. They see an oasis that God has created. You see, there, there's two things that you need to know about these temporary sanctuaries. They cannot be counted on. They cannot be counted on. I was asking, like I said, I don't think it's wrong to vote. I was asking a member of our church who's involved at, at, a, at the county level about two candidates for a county office the other day. And I said, I just, I just want your opinion because I really don't. I'm kind of in the peanut gallery here. And, and this person said to me, well, um, candidate A is a career politician who has never lifted a finger to help anybody in the county. Candidate B has been very active, an active listener to the issues that I've brought up to this individual. That they, they seem to really care. But, you know, I voted for such people in the past, and then I never hear from them again. Is that or is that not politicians? You want to count on that? Right? That's the sanctuary. You can't count on But here's the most important thing about a temporary sanctuary, whatever it is, guys. Nobody grows there. You, you, you just don't grow by being safe all the time, by being sure all the time. There's a time when you've got to put your faith in a sovereign God and believe that he is enough and that he will carry you through. We don't need a sanctuary. 
We need the presence of God. We need the presence of God because the presence of God will do something nothing else we might be tempted to cling to will do. It will turn hard ground into holy ground. You want to be there. Trust me, you want to be there. It will make us the very non-anxious people who are needed in this cultural moment. One final thing. Every promise we read about in Isaiah 54 is conditioned on the Messiah that is predicted in Isaiah 53. That this, none of this happens without Jesus. Right? All the trouble in the world is rooted in human sin and rebellion against God. That Messiah in chapter 53 took our sins on himself. They are paid for. You come to him today, all the promises of chapter 54 can be yours. That's what we see. That's what we see. God is, I believe with all my heart, stripping away things from us. Not because they're bad in and of themselves, but because he loves us. And he's saying, I got more for you. And the greatest revival, the greatest growth, the greatest spiritual power. Just read the history of the great revivals just in this country. Guys, the greatest spiritual power is just on the other side of moments like this one. It's ours if we want it. And what I'm asking you to do, what I'm begging you to do as your pastor, is let's meet this moment together. Let's be faithful and let's sing like the one who is formerly barren but is now full because she has the presence of the Lord. Let's enlarge our tent because there's some anxious refugees out there that need a permanent place of shalom. We can be that internally. We can provide that. God calls his people to just such a task in moments like this one. Let's be faithful. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is settled in heaven. Thank you that in a world of increasing uncertainty, that, Lord, we, we have a sure thing. Thank you that in a world of uttered prophecies everywhere, sometimes that contradict each other, that your servant Peter reminds us because the canon is closed, we have a more sure word of prophecy, a place that we can come, a place that we can lean, a place where we can find peace, a place where our anxious souls can be settled. And so, Lord, in the coming months, Lord, make us not only a people of peace, make us a people whose light radiates outward. And may the glory of the name of Jesus be made known by our example and by our witness which comes when people ask us about that example. Lord, I know there are many, many troubled hearts here. I know the struggle will continue breaks my heart, Lord, that I can't take it away. And so I pray on behalf of your people, Father, give them what they need in this hour. And what you have told us all that we need is your presence. So Lord, none of this is any good unless you saturate this place with your presence. And in this moment, we beg of you, Lord Jesus, come and be with us, mold us, make us. It's in his name we pray.